Hello, everyone. This is Nicholas Katman with the FDA Group. Welcome to the Life Science Rundown. Before we jump into our discussion for today, just a little bit about the FDA Group. We help life science companies in the areas of quality assurance, regulatory affairs, clinical operations, commissioning, qualification, and validation, as well as manufacturing and engineering. We offer three different engagement models, which are consulting, staff augmentation, and full-time employee recruitment. So if you ever find yourself in need, just head over to the fdagroup.com to check us out and get in touch. So today I'm speaking with David Marks. Hey, David. How you doing, Nick? I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, thanks for inviting me. All right. So um, the topic for today is exploring the link between uh, quality culture and QA communication pathways. Um, before we jump into that topic, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, David Marks, I've been in the industry, in the clinical research industry. Uh, this is my 30th year in the industry and uh, had kind of a non-traditional intro to the industry, but quickly found my groove. And so um, over that 30 years, I've spent time in clinical operations in phase one, uh, QC operations, quality assurance operations, um, back in back into ClinOps as an executive. I've been general manager, uh, heading up full service or even FSP groups, uh, as well as uh, now I'm on the consulting side, uh, presently doing some ad hoc consulting. Uh, but spent a fair amount of time in operations as well as in quality assurance. And now I'm just, uh, I guess you call it the quality guy, not so much on quality assurance. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So uh, like I mentioned, we're going to talk about quality culture, culture quality. We'll probably use those terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what does it mean? How can you create it? Is it really attainable? And why is it important to have? The why, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think approaching things with as with the thirty year view of things, I, I think having a quality culture or whatever the term is that your company uses is important because it's it it does make things faster, less expensive. Um, but let's also think, and I'm looking at it from a GCP lens, so from a clinical lens. I mean, at the end of the day. A lot of the quality goals revolve around patient safety and integrity of data. And so, um, I mean, quality quality culture can mean so many things in so many groups within an, an organization, not just biopharma, uh, but within the biopharma group. And I'm thinking about the clinical area. You need to have a culture of quality because quality and operations need to be separate, but they need to be partners. And if they're not singing from the same hymn, so to speak, uh, you're going to have you're going to have friction. You're you're going to have problems, um, and either you have, end up with more audits, more audit findings, and more reactivity versus the proactivity. Uh, but I feel like a quality of culture really builds more mature, um, um, proactive organizations. My compute, my uh, video went out briefly. No worries. Um, so there were a couple things you mentioned that I I. Um... I wanted to touch on, I guess the first one I want to touch on is the separation of operations and quality. Um, I have and continue to see sometimes quality reporting into operations. Um, and I think you and I have similar opinions on that. So why don't I pass that baton to you? And um, can you help me explain to those people listening why it shouldn't be reporting into operations? <laughs> well, Back to my earlier statement about I'm just the quality guy. I'm I'm not going to be able to recite regulation or, or or you know things with with that. But I, I think in any healthy organization, you need to have quality assurance be separate from operations. Um, I realize that in the grand scheme of things, you all report to the CEO. So ultimately, you will report to the same person at some point. Um, I feel like at a simple view. Quality being separate from operations removes the appearance of conflict of interest. Um, the reality is there's, there shouldn't be a conflict. You work for the same, or either there is a conflict or there is not. If you work for the same organization. So either the conflict is there or it isn't. Uh, I just have found healthier um, QA groups that did not report to operations because the person ultimately making the decisions that could affect a clinical program uh, didn't feel torn between their 
obligations to a QA group or an operations group. I've, I've also had the challenges of, okay, who does QA report to? If they don't report to the head of, of, of to the, you know, the CMO or, what, or whatever that person is, where do they report? Legal, um, you know, compliance, or where do they report? And I don't even want to touch that, but I think them being reporting separate, but really focusing on that partnership is, is what's healthy. And I think, um, I think over time, in my 30 years, and even with your career, Nick, uh, just you, you've probably seen that partnership. The, the reporting lines didn't mean as much as the communication between the groups, I feel like. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, what is your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see a conflict if quality were to report into operations, right? Because operations goal as a function is different than quality as sure. a function, right? And um, it's it's almost like a balance of power in government. It's good to have that balance. It's good. It's good friction. Yep. Um. And and so so it it there is a conflict. It's a healthy conflict because we're all working toward the same goal. Um, and, and we see these conflicts in other places too, right? So it's not just operations and quality. Um, it could be, you know, business development and, oh, yeah. um, and project delivery, right? So business development could just sell it and then say, hey, project delivery, you go and deliver, right? So you, so I could see a conflict there if project delivery was reporting into business development, because then they couldn't complain <laughs> to business development yeah. that you're not giving me all the specifications so I can deliver on your promises, right? Right. Yeah. So that, I've... that I think is why it needs to be separate. And, and because it's a healthy friction, there has Absolutely. to be a partnership, right? So just as I was using the reference of business development partnering with project delivery, because they have to have the ability to say, hey, I'm not getting all the information. It, it's the same thing here. Operations and quality needs a partnership. Absolutely. So um, can you paint a picture for the audience and how that would look if, if it was working well? Well, and I, maybe if it wasn't working well. Well, yeah, and, and we, can, we can probably use some jokes around when it isn't working. Um, you've probably seen several. I, I know I've seen several, um, not just from a quality perspective, but just a, you know, an employee perspective. But I think almost a backup to, to me, culture uh, within a, a company, it's, it's not just the, the mission statement or the words on paper or whatever. I mean, but when it comes to a culture of quality, I think you, you have to grow that and, it, and, and employees have to see it and hear it and be reminded of it. You know, the leaders need to exercise it, not to the the outside world. I mean, for a public company, not to the street, they shouldn't be talking about it. They should be talking about within the four walls of the company and 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 really uh, putting those words to action. I mean, I've had senior leaders, executive leaders that just an example would, would say, here's what we're going to do. This is back when I was in, in operations. You know, here's what we're going to do. And I've already talked with our QA head and this is, and they've already you know, kind of bless this, and this is what's going to happen. They, that's a that's a reinforcement that that executive has spoken to quality proactively, and you know it it kind of clears the air for employees, whether they're management or or, or, or lower employees. Like, oh, okay, we we you know we can partner with you know, with with quality, um, and so it, it's. But let, let's also acknowledge this is not just. A quality. I mean, I know we're talking about quality assurance today, but this culture of quality and and, and having that having employees see it, it's not just for quality assurance. It could be operations. Like you use your example with business development. It could be, you know, to legal or HR or you know other functions that people need. Employees need to see their leaders doing it, and then that opens the gate the gate for that culture of uh, that, that culture of quality or or or, or anything. I want to um, really focus initially or at this moment in time on the why, right? Um, because I've been to, sure, same as you, been to a lot of conferences where we talk about culture of quality and how to implement it. Um, for, for those people that maybe aren't, haven't bought in completely to why it makes sense, what, what would you say to persuade them that it does make sense? It depends on their motivation. Uh, with if, if they're questioning it, um, you know it's 
and I'll admit I, I have a business degree, so I, I, I'll kind of look at it from a business lens too. It's easier and cheaper and faster to do it right the first time, period, whatever that is. And um, in an operation- so It's more of a, a culture. So essentially, if I were to paraphrase, the culture of quality prevents downstream issues. Or should, or, or it should. should be- Or reduce. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean nothing's perfect. I mean, right. just you could have a you could have a company with I think a great culture of quality, a quality culture, however you want to say it. Um, they're not perfect. Mm -hmm. They just they just can talk about their issues mm -hmm. when they find them, and many times they can talk about them before they happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, issues are inevitable. So I think it's a matter of how you approach those things um, without ego, without fear. Uh, to be able to have healthy discussions between operations and quality. And, um, but again, I think people need to be, in some cases, they need to be brave. If they don't feel, if they don't know the answer to a question, they need help, they have to be brave to go to, to, to quality, whether it's QC or compliance or whatever the quality function is of the company to be able to have that discussion. Yeah. Um, and so, because it, it used to not, I mean, I think we've always had the challenge but I think over my 30 years, I've seen it become much easier for operations to ask their questions and, and get responses without fear of uh, repercussions. Yeah, and that's something I wanna dive into. Right before I dive into that, um, you know, there's, uh, I think generally speaking, when people think of quality, it's uh, somewhat of a necessary evil yeah. And it's a it's an added cost, right? So um, I don't know if you've ever seen the um, the meme on LinkedIn, but I know a lot of other people have. There's two mason jars, and it has QA budget before a warning yeah. letter and QA budget at, yeah after, right? And there's yeah. no coins in this one, and it's full over here. So um, investing in quality with the understanding that it's not just an added expense. In fact it can actually do the opposite and reduce costs that can come later on down the road. Absolutely. I, th I mean, it should. And if it isn't, I think you, you, the leadership that's of the, the company mindset. has. Absolutely. And, you know, kind of what I said earlier, it, it, it should be allowing you to do things faster or cheaper or easier. Um, and, and I don't want to get into the, you know, Six Sigma or anything else, but it's, it's making sure your processes are streamlined, make sure you can do things quick and fast and on quality. Um, but I think with, again, the, the thing that resonates in, in me and always has is there's a, there's a patient at the end, there's a person with an unmet medical need potentially at the end of this situation. So you, you all need to invest the time to do something right the first time or partner when there's a quality issue to, to get the right outcome uh, without worrying about who gets credit. Just talk about the issue. Yeah, find a you know find a solution and 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 get through it. But it's much cheaper and faster to do it right the first time. Yeah, and 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 just for the sake of being um, thorough, what are some of the downstream costs that um, people can reduce if they do have a culture of quality? Just so we can paint that picture, so it it, it wow. resonates. We could almost work backwards off of uh, a compliance situation. You know. Right. Uh, um, not getting into the whole um, true you know, failures of things, but uh, the cost of redoing. Um, I mean, just you could even look at the uh, one time I saw the, the cost, the average cost of a protocol amendment because a, a protocol wasn't well designed the first time. You know, QA found problems and it really worked upstream. They realized the protocol needed to be adjusted. Um, you know, the the cost of stopping projects in in process. Uh, now I can't imagine on the for our GMP colleagues the cost of stopping true you know manufacturing Production, operations. Yeah. Right, um, but in the in, in the clinical world, you know you're talking about tens of millions of dollars and being spent on some of these protocols, and um, and you need to make sure that people are you know the the patients are safe and and, and you have good good data, but when you find issues some of those can be significant I mean, I've, I've i've seen protocols have to stop you know I, I, because of the, things were so bad mm. um that isn't always the case it's just 
the cost of the errors. And some, sometimes the cost may be just at the site, it, or it may be all of the sites on a certain protocol. But what if it's higher than that? You mentioned you know, product development. What if the whole um, development program was wrong? Now, every protocol has to stop. Um, you know, there could be patients that who don't benefit as quickly if, if the compound is successful. Hmm. Uh, or, heaven forbid, you get a, a compound that should not make it to the market, but due to errors actually makes it to the market. Hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it could, it could really mushroom and, you know, go in different directions. But I, I think ultimately, people want to do things right the first time. Hmm. And I, but they also... Um, Again, you need to have a separation between operations and quality, but ultimately if, they're, if there's a healthy partnership there and you have a quality culture, people, are, people, people feel free to bring quality in earlier rather than waiting till the, as we used to joke in my history, you know, don't wait till the barn is on fire. Yeah, to go right. to, to go to to go to QA and say, hey, we've got we have a barn fire uh, versus saying, hey, we have this little thing and if we don't address it now, we think it could kind of grow uh, quickly, but that takes courage to really reach out to, if you don't have a culture of quality, to reach out and bring quality in. Um, so uh, to me, it's a matter of creating the environment where questions and answers are free flowing between operations and quality. Um, at the same time, the quality folks need to kind of be empathetic and, and really think about how it feels to be in operations and not know where to go. I know sometimes operations is busy, quality is busy. It's like, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for you. Um, you really need to make sure you have the right amount of it, of resources and, and time. Um, but I think the QA groups, QA folks need to make themselves available hmm. uh, to, 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 to get those, to receive those questions. Um, yeah. And that, that's what I want to dive into. The the one analogy I'm just going to uh, end this segment with as we move forward is I, I almost look at quality as um, like maintenance on your automobile, right? Um, I know a lot of people that don't want to spend the money on the maintenance. And then later on down the road, their engine fails, yeah. right? Or their... Um, uh, you know, they have their braking system starts to fall apart, yeah. right? So the maintenance Dangerous. can save you money down the road. It's an investment yeah. for the future. And in that case, it could also save a life. If it's Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's not just a, a dollars and cents that yeah, absolutely. And, and it, so we're going to go from dollars and cents to life and then we'll even move forward, which is if lives are lost, then what? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think it's also having the uh, humility to look at some of the issues in our industry through a common sense lens. Mm. Like some of the issues that pop up, they're just common sense. Like it, it, I've, I've had so many situations over the years with colleagues, whether I was in quality dealing with operations or I was in operations dealing back with quality, where we had issues where people were focused so much on the procedures or the regulations and not just looking at common sense, like, Hey, here's the problem. Here's this, you know, can we just agree this is the solution and, and work through that. And uh, because in, in, in your analogy that they're so worried about the amount of time and money it'll take to rip, to maintain the vehicle than just fixing it. Yeah. Well, let's get into that partnership piece, right? So on its face, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, the quality department is conducting audits on my work to find out what I'm doing wrong, right? I don't want to look bad to my uh, to the people that I report to and to the company. I don't want to have negative things happen that could affect um, my performance review. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I'm not calling the IRS to come and audit me. I'm not. Um, calling the FDA to come and audit me, right? So, yeah. so how how do we? Uh, what what is the reasoning whereby operations is incentivized to open the door to quality, and and how is that a benefit? Um. Yeah, I I, I think it's I've worked in. I'm just thinking of my selfish view of the industry and companies I've worked for or or, or worked with. Um, 
in some cases, you bring up performance review. I've, I've dealt in situations where performance reviews were directly linked to audit outcomes in, in, in operations. And that's, a, that's, that's tough. That, that, you know, your audit report becomes a punitive action against people in operations. And hopefully there are fewer of those organizations today than there were 20 plus years ago. Because um, that would de-incentivize you to bring in the absolutely. quality group. I, I mean, the first time I ever found that I was auditing in another country, I was working for a, a, a large pharma company, did an audit. And it was an, actually, it was an audit where the CRA requested it. I don't know if we want, if we want to take time on this topic, but but it was, it was basically yeah. um, Siri found some, you know, some suspect um, things happening, requested an audit happen. I go, I fly to the country, do the audit and found issues, found major items and critical items, which should, in my mind, you know, it, it kind of validated the concerns of the CRA. Come to find out the fact that there was an audit at their site that had critical major findings it actually penalized the CRA on their performance review because of the way that the, their system was set up in that country. And of course, I didn't find that out until after the report went out. I mean, I felt horrible. I, you know, we talk about conflict of interest. Maybe if I'd have known that ahead of time, I would have had a different, you know, challenge creating that report. But, um, that's you know hopefully those are those are few and far between situations today but that that definitely first time I saw that it was it was horrible um, but I feel like the best organizations don't just look at the issues they look at kind of repeated issues um, did it happen once did it happen twice um, if it happened more than once did it happen more than once on a certain protocol or a certain site or you know just you, you kind of draw yourself back from from that. Um, but I feel like today more organizations are in close partnership. There's so much data today that we have from all these electronic systems to where you can get things much easier than they were 20, 30 years ago when we were, you know, everything was on NCR case report forms and you, you, you had to you know, fight tooth and nail to get some sort of interim data out of uh, data management on things. Now it's just data is everywhere. And so you can kind of trend and look for things much, you know, much easier. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, just, I feel like uh, we've evolved in a, in a way that, that should make us closer to operations and, 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 and quality. But it is interesting when I, when I still see organizations that, um, that have, there's a, Un uncomfortableness to go mm -hmm. to quality with, with, um, with a question, a simple question, which may end up being a simple question, a simple answer. But they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to ask QA. They're gonna, they're gonna audit me. Mm. You remember those, those conversations? Yeah. It's like, it's like, okay, is that really the consequence of asking a question? Mm. Um, and if it's fear or ego, those are individual uh, things, but. If there's if there's just not a safe environment to ask questions, then that's a different that's a different uh, situation. Um, you, you know, I think over over time, uh, something that started innocently with me that grew um, was what a colleague later on called the five hundred one discussions, uh, the things you talk about after five o'clock. Um, and so that we work for a company that didn't really it didn't have good. Uh, communication pathways between operations and quality. Um, and so um, at the time, I actually was dating a person who was in operations. And and so I would sometimes find myself in the same social circles, same, same social circles, circles with her. Um, and people like, oh, my gosh, what's the QA guy doing here? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, you know, it, it was the QA guy. And um, but then after a while, sometimes like, hey, while you're here, yeah, I had this situation. You're in a safe environment. You may be at a restaurant or a sports bar or something. You're out of the office, and um, but I always like to help. I mean, in, in quality, I think you have different mentality. So you have some people in quality who love the power of auditing and they they, they want to be feared. And hopefully, there are fewer of those today than there were many years ago. Uh, but at the end of the day, quality is there to help. 
They're there to find find the problems that they're there, but they're they should be there to help. That I mean, operations is kind of their clients or customer, and um, and I think, uh, but back to those five hundred one discussions. Uh, I mean, I've had situations where, like, hey, you got a minute, you know, and and they'll tell you what's what's going on and what what they think, and maybe there's nothing there, but they at least came and talked about it, and then but they also then felt like there was a trust there that they I wasn't going to abuse that privilege of them coming to me with 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 questions, and um, and those five hundred one discussions, I, I've I've seen them just pay for themselves in, in spades you don't talk about cheap um you can spend more money on auditing or you can actually as an organization have more energy and resources toward partnering with operations to prevent problems um and i, I felt like over the years those five the 501 discussions or whatever that you, you just you you showed that you were open and available to to talk about things without consequence without judgment um and, and sometimes they were small things and you just kind of hash them out and no, no harm, no foul. But sometimes they were big topics. And then we would partner to escalate those to the organization. Yeah. As a, as a quality professional, understanding, um, uh, well, actually, let me, let me take that back. As, a, as an operations person, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm saying, yeah, now that's making a lot of sense to me. Now, how do I determine that the culture that I'm working in is going to allow for those types of, as you put it, 501 discussions? And how am I going to be able to determine whether or not it it is something that could turn toxic? Oh, you mean like if they if they ask the wrong question, the wrong person? If they start turning it from a let me help you to oh i see we've got an issue let's audit you let's report it yeah <laughs> well i i think historically that's ha- that's what happened i mean mm-hmm. i know when i started in the industry 30 years ago um i was in operations for the first three years it's a phase one unit you know clinical research unit and i was a nerd who would ask questions of the quality people hey i've got this question what do you think and sometimes it bit me. They're like, oh, that's a silly question. Why would you ask that? And then they start, mm. you know, they want to audit things. And I think that was a, a power or ego type topic. Um, but I feel like there's less of those out there to, to today. Um, I, honestly, Nick, I, I, I think at the end of the day, people have to just have, they have to have courage to ask a question. And, um, but at the same time, one of the things I th- I'm, I'm thinking about is, um, it's more frequent today than it used to be, but there are companies that have mechanisms mechanisms in place that allow employees to ask anonymous questions of their quality group. Um, if if there's ego or fear or whatever, having that system that there are third party systems that that can handle this. Um, I mean, there's a there's a tipping point where you don't want to systemize everything, but. Um, but I feel like there needs to be a way to ask questions without fear of con- of consequences. And um, I know there are, I've worked with many awesome quality professionals over the years, uh, either in QA or in operations working back. And at the end of the day, most of them, they just, they want to do a good job. They want to help. And I think it's a matter of finding those people and focusing the question on them. Um, flip side is when I was in quality, assurance departments and one of the probably the second or third company i worked for um we had another term we would call in we were in qa we would uh, create these quality ambassadors within operations groups so there were individuals within clin ops data management stats medical writing whatever you know you just Mm -hmm. there were certain people in those groups who really had more of a mind for quality or they wanted to do things better or faster Mm or whatever and they became kind of the sacrificial lamb. They'd be the first ones to come to to quality with a question, be like, "Hey, here's a, here's the situation. Here's what we, here's what how you're going to handle it. Thank you. Please tell your friends that we're not going to bite." Uh, but in some cases, those people became 
the person, the people in those departments, that everyone went to them with their questions, and then they would come to us on behalf of the person asking. Um, but at the end of the day, you just want to have a good, safe environment where people feel like they can ask a question, get an answer. If it is a big topic, you need to just agree that hey, this is this is a big topic. We need to we need to escalate this. Whether it's a whether it's a kappa, whether that's something needs to be discussed agree on how it was brought up. Hey, so-and-so was talking to Q, you know, talking to so-and-so in QA, they talked about this and they realized this is, a, this is a big topic and we need to have a bigger discussion about this. Um, some things are big and, and they need to be addressed. They need to be escalated. But over the years, I feel like more of those 501 discussions dealt with the issues when they were small. Right. And they didn't grow to the big barn mm. burning topics mm -hmm. and so i think that culture of quality is based on trust mm. um lack of egos um it's just like who cares who gets credit for fixing a problem just fix it mm. here's the problem let's talk about how to fix it get it fixed yeah don't worry about who gets credit yeah and it you know you used a lot of different words that resonate um you know being you know having the courage to go and um, you know, just interestingly enough, you, you said a lot of these conversations are small before they get bigger, right? Um, and, and one of the things that um, I do and I recommend other people do with people that report to them is, you know, having one-on-one -on -one meetings, which is very similar to the 501 thing. Um, and uh, what I explain to people and encourage people to do is say, hey, listen, I need you to tell me whatever issues exist. I don't care if it's the color of my shirt, it's the flavor of the coffee in the, the break room, whatever. I need you to tell me because here's the consequence if we don't have a conversation. Yeah. Something's going to happen. And then, you know, but it's not a big deal. I don't want to escalate it. But then it, it happens again and again. And now my frustration builds and builds and builds. And now by the time it's brought to light, it's too late. Yeah. That, and, and in my example, too late is that person is so overwhelmed and aggravated and frustrated, they're accepting phone calls from recruiters and then they're going to end up leaving the yeah. organization, right? Yeah. But And, and it, just because somebody brings something up doesn't mean they're always going to get what they need. But sure. at least it means we can have a conversation and and. Quite honestly, usually I found when people bring things to me, there is a resolution that is satisfactory to them. It, it, it's, at, it's much more the case. But if yeah. there isn't a solution to that particular issue, um, at least we can come to an understanding as to why. I'm glad you said that because I was just thinking the same thing. I, I found the best situations, best 501 discussions that that we had over the years, uh, it was like, here's the situation, here's what we need to do, here's how we need to do it, but here's why we need to do it. And that why resonated more back into operations. Here's what, here's the situation, here's what, here's how, but here's why. Um, I think we hear a lot more about the why in in business, whether it's your personal why, you know, my why, mm -hmm. um, or just why in operations. I, I remember, <clears throat> gosh, I was probably 10 years into my career and I did one of the professional de professional uh, development seminar. It could have been through DIA and it was around why. And after being in operations in QA for a few years at that point, I always thought about it. Well, here's the situation. Here's what needs to happen. Here's how it needs to happen. Didn't even think about the why. And that flipped my mindset explicitly to say, okay, the why people need to really understand that because that'll that that to me that why is the prevention step for the next situation mm -hmm. it's not just fixing this situation the why prevents the next situation or they can tell their colleagues here's what we did and here's why we did it mm. um so that to me, to me that's 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 pretty important uh, and whether that's like yeah the 501 discussions i think helped i think also I, i've um I think at times QA needs just the reverse. QA needs a communication pathway back into operations that isn't 
in an audit. It isn't in um, tr a, a true, you know, official situation. And sometimes me being in, in quality at, at, at times, if I had a question about operations, like, hey, how do you all do this? Here's what's going on. Our, you know, our auditors or we have questions in this. Can I, can I talk to you about just kind of what's going on here? Safe environment. I got to be able to ask a safe environment question as a QA person to operations without them thinking it's turning, it's going to turn into an audit, you know, because they, they don't want to think it's going to be a, that's, that's the seed question of a process audit. It's like, no, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Help me understand this. Sometimes those people who I asked the question to, and, and when I was in QA, they were more apt to come to me with questions later, safe questions. Hey, David, I'm, I have this situation. What do you think? I initiated it, the relationship, so to speak, um, and they felt more comfortable to talk to me. So I think it, I mean, it absolutely is a two-way street, but ultimately you both win, your company wins. It's, 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 it's not about ego or not about credit. It's just, you have a lot of people in organizations who care about you know, their paycheck and the products that they make. But in our industry, they should also care about the patients who may receive those meds. That, that, that's ultimately downstream, you yeah. know? Um, and so it, I don't want to go full butterfly effect on, you know, these situations, but in some cases they can have fatal outcomes if not addressed. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's important to state that fact um, because people need to hear it. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to for people to connect that far downstream right sure. um so uh here's here's where i want to go with the conversation so let's say we're in an organization and it's it's not toxic okay so on a scale of 1 to 10 you know we're somewhere between a 7 and a 9 okay so we're not killing it but we're also not toxic so there's room for improvement there's room for improvement. So, um, you know, and in this imaginary company that I'm I'm creating in my mind, there's there's quality, there's operations, and there's management and leadership. Um, and and all three are subscribing to the idea that, you know what, we want to accelerate our ability to have a quality culture because we're subscribing to the ideas that are found in this podcast. So what would you recommend for each of those individuals or departments that could bring them from that seven, eight up to a nine or 10? It's a deep, it's a deep question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, one of the, you know, I, there's so many there are different, different ways to, to approach it, but I think a lot of it has to do with We've talked about things and egos or fear or, or trust and all the other things. But I think um, one of the things I think about is the friction versus power topic. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard this. There was a the podcast I heard a year or two ago, um, Hidden Brain. It was a, it was a one of their uh, NPR as a podcast series, and uh, it was one. It was around obstacles you don't see. And it was in the main, the crux of the thing was around less friction versus more power. And I think when you look at those situations, you can, you can think about, well, it is, is the issue that you need more quality, you need more quality assurance people, or you need more, you need more audits, you need more, or is it that you need less friction, you, you need less barriers. Um, and so it's got that, that less friction versus more power. And you can mm -hmm. put that into cars or airplanes or whatever but i think in our industry i always thought about the the, the friction what like you said earlier the healthy friction between operations and quality but in some cases that friction is not not healthy mm. people are don't it causes too much friction to get qa involved it's like oh don't let's just fix it don't don't tell qa um so i, I think it's to do that i feel like in from a I'm hoping I'm answering the question here is that, you know, from a QA aspect, it's not a matter of, not a matter of bringing in more auditors. If there's a, if there's a problem, maybe you need to put as much resources to partnering with operations as you have in doing the audits. Now, those people partnering with operations may not be the auditors. They may be, you know, they're, they're not as ob objective. Maybe they need to be more kind of the client partnering QA people as opposed to having the auditors in the field. 
Um, but I, I think it's a matter of having resources that are dedicated to supporting clinical if it's a larger organization, as opposed to just spending the money on more audits, more kappas, more, more trending. So you're, you're kind of putting more, more resources toward preventing problems and then fixing problems. And that's kind of the less friction versus more, more power uh, in this example. Um, so I, I hope I answered your, your, your I question. Think you that, did. That, I... That's its own, its own topic around more power or less friction. Yeah, I, I think it did. I want to I want to give you a, a different example and then see if you can tie that into this space. So um, so when we we here at the FDA group, we have management and meetings and um, one of the sections of each executive meeting is called the scorecard. And that's where we have different measurables and KPIs and we we monitor it. Um, the, the scorecard is the most difficult um, aspect I found for business, and I'll explain why. Um, it's not that I'm afraid of the truth. It's not that we don't know how to measure. What it is, is for the things that we're investing time and money on measuring, mm -hmm. what, what are we getting out of it so that we can make good decisions? Yeah. Right? And so what, what we find um, and, and this is going to continue to be true, is measurables and KPIs that made sense before don't necessarily make sense now. And at the same time, there might be, because of the evolution of the business, there might be new measurables and KPIs that we need to begin measuring, because that's going to give us information so that we can make good decisions. Yeah. Back to the earlier topic, there's so much data and it's, and it's data, data, data. Is uh, My question is always, is it information? Can you do something with that data, yeah. right? You can, you can measure anything. Uh, just like KPIs, you can have a hundred KPIs. What do we focus on you know, the, the right ones? What, and I'll tell you, I, I don't have an answer to this, but, but one thing I've, I, I struggle with in quality was measuring true outcomes of the quality effort you can mm. measure, you can count the number of audits, you can count the number of critical findings, major findings, whatever. I mean, just like the yeah. FDA does, you know, their BIMO trending data, we did this many inspections and this many findings. And what they don't measure is how many issues they prevented. Yeah. Yeah. That's just tough. I, and I don't, I wish I had a magic bullet on that one. I'd be more wealthy than I am, you know, but it, it it's, it's tough. And I think as, as a leader of a company or as a group, you can't weigh too heavily on those KPIs or you kind of got to look at the data behind that data. Um, what was the impact versus what does the data show? And, and in some cases, it's hard to, it's just hard to measure what you prevent. Yeah. You can, you can measure what you fix. Um, the flip side is uh, one of my, I guess a couple of companies ago, they, they turned their, QA communication um, pathway into a system and you had to submit your questions. Mm. At first it was neat. It was cool. You could ask QA, uh, you know, you could send a message to this, this thing. It, 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 I think it served its purpose for a while and then it turned into um, its own metric. We received this many questions. We made uh, this many answers yeah. and we, re we made those answers within so much time period and they kind of lost from a operation standpoint. Mm. Some of the, what was lost was the, the true feeling of being heard and getting an issue solved. Granted, a large organization, you, if you work for one of the household name, big pharma companies or big biotech, I can't imagine the volume of questions that, that they have to handle uh, into the QA group. And so they, you need to systemize it somehow. But my, my point is, I, I think, you need to appreciate there are some things you can't measure, or I just haven't found a Figured way to it measure out. yet. And right. that's, that's the problem with the scorecard. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about is how do we measure it? How do we find out how much has been prevented and what is the cost savings? I, I And life case savings, case, it, right? Oh, oh, I mean, yeah, that's, 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 that's really where you, where you can, I think a smart leader can look at that and say, can you imagine what we just prevented um, from from happening? 
unless someone says, yeah, but how do you know how big you, your prevention was? You don't know how to measure some of that. But I think within those KPIs, you, you can't just you can't just lose yourself in the data and say that, mm-hmm. you know, these KPIs give true outcomes. They they give a lot of outcomes, but they don't I don't, I don't think in ways they, they truly give a, a, a full reflection of impact of, of effort with quality because quality did this many audits this many kappas this many findings we can trend here's our, our top category and those are great those are great um data milestones to to look at and you can say our, our kpis our goal is to have x number of criticals y number of majors and you can look at you have your your goal be those things but i have yet to see a goal of we want to prevent X number of situations or, or measure those. Cause it's really hard to measure those. Yeah. Um, and, and it's almost like the unsung hero of quality uh, and operations communications are those prevented uh, issues. Yeah. A lot, of, think, a lot of effort. I think we can get there. I think, but again, yeah. when I say scorecard is the most difficult, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I actually have a, a, a familial uh, situation Uh, So my wife and I, well, I shouldn't say my wife and I, my wife was cooking a turkey and or a chicken in the oven or something. And it was inside a a bag and there was oil inside the bag and it was cooking and we had to run out for something. And um, she goes, oh, should I shut the oven off? I "I don't know. It's, I think it's fine. So I don't know. I'm, I say, tell you what. We're only going to be out for a little while. Let's just, let's, you know, let's not keep the oven on. Let's shut it off. We'll come back. We lose a little bit of time. No big deal. Right. So shut it off, go out, do what we needed to do. Come back, turn it on. Well, when we turned it back on, the bag had sprung a leak and the oil was overflowing into the oven and it created an oven fire that we quickly extinguished. And for a week or longer, I didn't allow ourselves not to have gratitude with the fact that our house almost burned down. Yeah. You know, and said, hey, listen, I know this happened five days ago, but before we eat dinner, let's just thank God that, yeah, you know, he, you know, told us, shut the oven off and then resume when, when you're there to supervise it. So... Um, I think in light of this quality culture and partnership between operations and quality, there's a whole lot of efficiencies that we collectively need to work toward because that's what's actually going to give us the real pulse on the business. The how many audits we did, is that good or is it bad? Right. How many findings do we have? Well, is that good or is it bad? Right. And so, and, and I'm not, this is the most difficult thing in my opinion, and we're not going to get all the way down to pure clarity, but what we can do collectively, if we all subscribe to a culture of quality is just bring it down one level at a time and see how much more uh, clarity we can get and how much, how how much better of a grasp we have on the pulse of the business. Well, I I think what you just talked about makes me I mean, first of all, glad you had you avoided your house fire situation. That would have been horrible. But it makes me think about. I've had times in my in my past where being a, a QA head or, or 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 you know just getting around that annual budget cycle when the bean counters or the comptroller, whoever it is, finance. You know, how much do you need next year? Can you do more with less? Can you do the same with less? Yeah, and having a Having that discussion of well, we we did this many audits, we had this many findings, and at times it's kind of showing that impact of if you take away, if you don't let us grow, how am I going to quantify what we aren't going to be able to manage? It, I know it's double negative, but it's right. It, it's a matter of really looking at things, and it's not just the data. It's just how, then how do you justify the costs? Mm-hmm which you're in a business, you have to be profitable or you need to be profitable. And typically QA is a, um, 
not a profit center, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I used to I used to put it in terms of like football terms, like you know, clean ops, everything else, sales. That's your offense. QA. That's your defense. Yeah. And um, you can chinch on you. Know, you, you can you can you can kind of cut cost on your defense, but what's it gonna what's it gonna cost you? You're gonna have to score so much more. Yeah. To you know to win the game. Yeah. Um, and and, and 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 actually to your point. It's a balance. So Absolutely. when the bean counters come, doesn't mean that we're going to be, we, uh, and I'm representing quality, means we're going to try to go for the maximum budget because that doesn't necessarily make sense for the business. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's part of what I was saying earlier is maybe the answer isn't more auditors to do more audits. Maybe it's a matter of get some in-house people to kind of help with that interaction between operations and prevent. You're going to be as we just said, it's hard pressed to quantify or measure the benefit of that. But ultimately, I, th I think your operations teams should feel more support. I know mm -hmm. it's hard to put a financial number on feelings, right, when it comes to dealing with finance. But I think the more operations feel supported, mm -hmm. the more they'll go to bat for you come, come budget season. Um, and I've had situations like that in the past where we had such a healthy relationship with operations that when we were getting pinched, they went to the table and said, hey, finance, what can we do to partner to try to find a way to get quality what they need? And maybe it wasn't, again, maybe it wasn't more auditors, maybe it was a different role being brought in, but they depended on us and they and they went to bat for us. And and that was, um, it was a proud moment. It didn't just happen overnight. Uh, but it was a, we didn't call it a culture of quality, but we had a really healthy partnership with operations at that company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this might sound um, utopian, but kind of reimagining what does quality look like in a culture of quality. Um, and this is uh, just, if if we're on the topic of how do we improve our culture of quality, Um you know, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is if uh, something is caught early, right? Um, what if rather than just saying, oh, glad we caught that and let it go, what if we created a story yeah. and then we announce that story? So, hey, uh, operations and quality partnered, they were able to identify this issue had it not been caught for six months, here are the ramifications in terms of operations ability to produce, uh, how many more quality professionals and consulting firms we would have had to bring in to resolve the issue, how much we'd have to pay on legal services with FDA or um, any other regulatory authorities, and, yeah. and then what, what could have been the impact on life and create that story. Like an like an impact analysis. Yeah. Um. I mean, and which also takes time and money to create. That's the problem. But, <laughs> but, That's the problem. So so yeah, it's it's you, you kind of get in this cycle of of things. But I but I think I think a good I think good leaders in operations or quality or together mm. uh, could probably partner up with that impact analysis or, or or in a way to put some flesh on the bone of of, of what what that effort to prevent meant to the organization and how that may have been cheaper or leaner um, uh, than just the rest of the traditional quality assurance operations. Yeah. Um, it, it's, 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 there's no one way to do it, but I know I like your idea, uh, and, yeah. but it's, but it's, but it's also, uh, those become, I think, good town hall topics to where mm -hmm. leaders can come back to the town hall and say, Hey, Here's an example of where our operations and quality work together. And here's where here, those are the feel good stories. Those aren't metrics. Those aren't KPIs. Those are, I mean, those, those should be a shot in the arm, make you feel good. Yeah. Uh, and the question is to what degree are we going to create that story? Right. Because there's, true. there's other types of stories we do all the time that don't service the same um, or, or don't serve the same impact. So like a case study, yeah. We had this big issue. We fixed it. Here were the results. Okay, what am I learning? Well, don't get in that situation <laughs> yeah. again, yeah. right? Turning but, a positive, it's turning a negative into a positive versus right. 
the positive positive into a positive right yeah. or postmortems right so we're very familiar with case studies and postmortems um and and this seems like if 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 it's something that somebody is really passionate about enhancing in terms of a, a culture of quality um you know imagining the that impact you know because i i'm i'm actually kind of getting excited about the idea of people hearing about how ops and, and quality partnered and they they were able to achieve that and i i feel that that energy yeah. and that success and i want to contribute and and now we're starting to open up and we're starting yeah. to realize that you know defense ain't you know, complaining that offense ain't scoring enough points and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, we're coming together as one unit and then we're checking the scoreboard at the end of the game. Love it. it but that, I've held back some of my sports references because I tend to th <laughs> throw those in too much. But yeah, I I've, I, uh, I use that to one of my last um, bosses. He was the president of our division. We were good friends. And, and now I would always talk about, you know, it's like, costing this i'm like yeah defense costs money you know uh you can spend how do you want to spend your money and um but i, but I think also um having the opportunities to co-present like you said that's yeah that's uh that's that's gold there if you can make you, you're not gonna you're not gonna stumble into the situation you probably have to create those situations to co-present quality and operations to co-present on something um and that should be uh, there should be a venue for that. Yeah. And, and well, uh, maybe. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just thinking about how it, it almost seems like defense is a holding, holding it for the offense. Right. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So when you talk about the co-presenting and, and I, I don't care, I'll go back into the football analogies. Yeah. Was it the fact that the offense fumbled on the one yard line and the defense prevented yeah. the touchdown and blocked the field goal? Or is it that, you know, defense just let the the game winning score go by and there's only 20 seconds left on the clock, but we just threw a Hail Mary and scored the winning touchdown. So both can save the other. Agreed. I, I just, I guess I spend more than half my career on the defense side on a, either quality assurance or in a, with, a, with a quality role. And um but at times you have to appreciate you both play for the same team mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you have this, you have the same goals. Sometimes it's like, it goes back to conflict resolution methodology, being able to un understand the, the conflict. You, you may have the same goal. You, you, have, you really don't want the same things, but you have, you have this appearance of a conflict that maybe isn't really an appearance of, it really isn't a conflict. Ultimately you want to win the game. What does that mean? You have to score more points and pre prevent the other things from happening with, with quality assurance it's, or with quality QC compliance, whatever you want to call it, whatever the names of those operations are, they're there to help you um, not lose. At the same time, that helps you win, right? Um, so whether that's baseball with offense and defense, whether that's, you know, whatever it is. Um, and but, but but really the, the offense gets all the glory, right? I mean, quarterback, really? the offense, they they won the game. Yeah. When really it was it was both it was both of those eleven person groups. Yeah. You know, uh, doing that, but I think uh, I think you're right. I think it's 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 hard to quantify, measure prevention, um, unless you spend effort to find a way to quantify those. And um, whether that's some sort of a, a new KPI or try to th you know, think about how to um, incubate that KPI in a way to figure out how can we measure this in a specific organization. But again, I think it's going to be different for manufacturing. GMP, GCP are going to have different ways to, to do that. Yeah. But, but it takes a leader with experience to say, well, that little situation, folks, looked like this. But had it not been caught, it would have looked like this back to your, you know, yeah, cooking situation. And and, and uh, not that you want to look at every situation as what if uh, there's a lot of them you can probably focus on and say, had we not caught this early, it, it would have turned into something or we caught this and the cost was only X. Had we not caught it, the cost would have been Y. Right. Um, and it could be a range. It could be 
hey, we would have caught the fire and replaced the oven and redone the kitchen versus <laughs> right. the whole thing burns to the ground. So even with them in the realm of speculation, you can come up with realistic ranges of possibilities. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, um, but you know, I, I, I think just to back up to an earlier topic, I, I think when, when I think of culture of quality, I think of how much better things are today than they used to be. And, and at the time, 30 years ago, I didn't, I didn't know. You, you only know what you can work in and feel, but looking back on those time periods, uh, I think there were, there were more organizations where QA was com not just separate on an organogram. They were physically like put QA in a different building on the campus, a different <laughs> yeah. campus. What to keep them away from our folks. Yeah. Uh, don't invite them to meetings. Don't ask them questions and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, they may still have had a, a quality culture somehow. I, I don't know. But, um, but I think today, my experience working at biopharma companies and also working in, you know, in the CRO or consulting world, um, I see more times than not where operations brings quality into program planning meetings mm. and program update meetings where they used to just keep them away. Like, don't tell them anything. They just need to know when to do their audits, <laughs> when, yeah. when to stop. Um, and, and so I, I think as much as we, we're talking about ways, you know, whether it's less friction, more power, 501 topics, opening up the, you know, the lines of communication, I think we have to appreciate how much our industry has evolved over the last 30 years. And this little interaction about how to measure prevention, give it a couple of years, someone smarter than me, at least, is going to figure out a way to measure that easily um, and, and put that together. Uh, just like um, when QA directors or QA heads get get asked, you know, how much, you know, uh, uh, how much do you need? How much does how much does this quality cost? Back to your earlier meme with the small jar before warning letter and the big meme after. But this truly, don't worry about the after warning letter. I mean, how much? How many coins should be in that jar beforehand? Yeah. And I think I think quality professionals and quality leaders need to be able to quantify things and then back that up with some data. Uh, but the challenges we have today, they're probably not going to, we're going to have different challenges in five years. Yeah. And this challenge may be fixed. Yeah. I hope. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, the, and, the, of, and the measuring too, just um, it, it's whether, it, and even if we're going to use the the jar with a few coins, right? How do we get that as close to optimized as possible? And then at the same time, um, we talk about like, how do there there are certain things that to to the vast majority of people are impossible to measure and they are impossible now correct right the only way we can get turn the impossible into possible is by incremental uh changes in our ability to fine tune what we're measuring because it wasn't like we went from cavemen to landing on the moon Right. That that didn't happen. It was year, you know, hundreds of years of right. little tiny incremental processes, you know, and um, it, it, it brings me back to a thought I had uh, or one of the things my father said to me growing up is he said, Nick, you don't have to do a lot more than everybody else. You just have to do a little more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I understand. I my. uh in my household, my father was Mr. Fix it. You know, it was, um, but it was, but he strong work ethic, and it was do more, do better. You know, it was always do a little bit more. Um, but I think with with organizations in our industry, I, I agree with you. It's do a little bit better every week or every month or every year. Um, but we, I, I feel like at times right now, I've I've worked in companies where the the volume of data was overwhelming. And it was hard to just pick out the right measures to, to, to show or know if you're incrementally better this month or this quarter, not in financial terms. Cause again, we're on, we're on defense. We just spend money. Mm. You know, QA doesn't, QA costs money. Mm. It doesn't make money. Um, but being, being able to find those metrics that are, that show the value and to show that incremental benefit. Um, I, I feel like it's, 
many organizations still go back to the same old KPIs, number of audits, number of findings. Oh, this year we had less, we had less critical findings. Well, does that mean you had less critical issues or because you just found fewer of them? Right, exactly. Um, and, and so you know, keep me the naysayer out of that meeting, right? Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, you, well, actually, well, you need leaders, to be in that meeting. Well, true, but, you, but it's, <laughs> I, I'm usually the person you want to keep out of the meeting because I'll be yeah. like, excuse me, yeah. um, um, like a different industry. I, I live in Texas and, and we had a... Um, health report talking about food inspectors restaurant inspectors and my town is outside of a bigger city and there was a discussion around our town had more uh, failing grades of restaurants and how the big city near us didn't have any failing grades of restaurants and it, it was the story was spun in a way that's like well this town has bad restaurants and this town here has good restaurants when the reality was well are, are the inspectors doing their job in the big town Right. Or, or I was just really doing their job and finding the problems. You know, it, it's, I think this translates into many industries, but some of us who are the type to ask those questions will ask, like, what does that number really mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, you but, at the same, but, but at the same time, that's why when someone says, how do you measure these topics? I look at it from how can I measure it, but then also how can I defend it? Mm. And those prevention measures, uh, I'm glad you asked. I need to put some thought into that because uh, I haven't thought about that in a while. I know it. I feel it. I mean, it feels good when you're able to prevent problems, but it's hard to translate that feeling into a KPI or a measurable mm. thing. Yeah. And it, it really, at the end of the day, let's just take one step. Yeah. Right. Uh, and we'll we'll get closer to the promised land and and then to your your um, in restaurant inspection, you know, uh, and I say this tongue in cheek, but there's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? So <laughs> that, that that's a good yeah. example of that. No, I, I completely agree with you. As a as a really good friend of mine in stats years ago told me, make this number up. He was like, you know, you know, sixty three point two percent of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> that's and great. The first and the first time I heard him. <laughs> You were like, really? I I paused because I thought he was actually giving me a statistic. I know. (laughs) And then I realized what what he had just said. But he was one of the few statisticians with a a good sense of humor like that. And um, and so I I have used that quote many times. uh, So I I, I love what you just said, too. Yeah. Well, if you like that one, then um, why don't you start telling your friends that gullible actually is a slang word and it's not in the dictionary? You'll you'll get some people, I promise you. <laughs> Who will um, also be, be Googling the term. Yeah. So this is great. Um, I really had a lot of fun with this one. Um, this is great. Before, before we end and close, is there anything you want to leave the audience with? And or if people wanted to find you, how can they find you? Um, I mean, if you want to find me, I'm, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. I, I'm uh, admittedly on a little bit of a career break, uh, just doing some ad, ad hoc work um, for the next short term uh but linkedin um my profile is there i'm probably the only david marks with a big shiny head uh, in the profile um but I, this was really fun i appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about some of these topics um with like-minded people absolutely well thank you very much and to everybody listening as always If you find conversations like this valuable, please share it with a colleague or your professional network. If you haven't already, subscribe to get updates of new episodes at thefdagroup.com slash podcast and follow the FDA Group on LinkedIn. If you'd like to connect about project or resource needs, head over to thefdagroup.com to get in touch and feel free to connect with me personally on LinkedIn. So thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Thanks.